all live in a watershed. At Pennsylvania American Water, we are deeply protective of our watersheds because millions of people depend on us every day for safe, clean drinking water. We take care of water from the source to the tap and back to the source again, taking pride in returning it cleaner than we found it. Join us in keeping our watersheds clean so together we can keep life flowing for generations to come. Should I start? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I, I couldn't hear anyway. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> uh, hi everybody, I'm Bob Irvin. I'm the president and CEO of American Rivers. Uh, at American Rivers, we believe that life needs rivers. And at a time like this, when our health and well-being are threatened by a pandemic and a historic economic downturn, it's more important than ever that we have safe, clean, affordable water, as well as healthy rivers that support and strengthen our communities. And that's what we're all about. From our headquarters in Washington, DC, and offices across the country, American Rivers works to protect wild rivers, restore damaged rivers, and conserve clean water for people and nature. In 2018, American Rivers and I were honored to receive the Stroud Center's Freshwater Excellence Award. And for me, the best part of the day was the time I spent touring the Stroud Center, seeing some of the research projects and facilities, and meeting the talented scientists who work there. It's wonderful to be partnering today and, and for the next several months with the Stroud Center on this series of talks on the Delaware River. This spring, American Rivers honored the Delaware River as River of the Year for 2020. We made this announcement in conjunction with our annual America's Most Endangered Rivers report. We feel it's important to spotlight success and celebrate progress. We chose the Delaware for the massive turnaround it has undergone in the last 50 years when it comes to water quality and river health. As Ted Ilston, our Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations at American Rivers, will explain in a few minutes, Safeguards and regulations like the Clean Water Act played a critical role in the recovery of the Delaware, and so have the actions taken by local communities to reconnect to the river. The Delaware is at the forefront of innovative solutions when it comes to improving water quality and river health. The successes in Camden and Philadelphia are just a few examples of the hundreds of stories happening all along the Delaware to make the river safer and cleaner for the people that rely on it. We created a virtual tour of some of the successes and leaders along the Delaware. You can check it out on our website at AmericanRivers.org slash along the Delaware, or just type in Delaware River in the search box and you'll find the virtual tour. This series of webinars with American Rivers and Stroud is going to explore the various reasons for the Delaware River's progress, and where we can still improve. Today, we'll be talking about where so many conservation solutions begin, the confluence between science and policy, how they work together to create a clear vision and path forward for the rivers and the people and wildlife that rely on them. Now I'm proud to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. David Arscott, Executive Director of the Stroud Center. Dave? Hey, thank you, Bob. Uh, I've been at the Stroud Center for about 15 years, but since 1967, the Stroud Center has been building knowledge and stewardship of freshwater systems globally through our research and now education and restoration. From our headquarters here in the Delaware River, watershed in southeastern Pennsylvania. Along the way, we've studied many river systems and had many collaborations and colleagues helping us with these activities. We've had a long history of interaction and collaboration with American Rivers, and we're honored and happy to collaborate uh, with American Rivers as we celebrate the Delaware River Watershed River of the Year designation. Of course, today's part one of this four-part series, the intersection of science 
and Policy for Clean Water and Healthy River. It's the first in our series. The Delaware River watershed, of course, has a long history. Its degradation and its subsequent improvements and restorations certainly make this a success story. But for our natural resources worldwide, this story is still in the making as we move forward through the next step in our Earth's history. And we must continue to protect and restore our environment for our freshwater systems uh, and the health of our global community. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Jackson of the Stroud Water Research Center. He's a senior scientist. He'll speak after Ted. John spent 30 years of his career at the Stroud Center. Those 30 years span a substantial portion of the duration of the Clean Water Act. And he spent much of his time working in the Delaware River and its tributaries on topics ranging from ecology of our streams and rivers, studying water quality impacts on aquatic organisms, and understanding what it takes to restore our uh, streams and rivers. He does that through a lens uh, that he spends the most time with, aquatic insects and macroinvertebrates. And he and other colleagues at the Stroud Center sit on several Delaware River Watershed Advisory Committees and provide service to federal agencies that carry out regulatory aspects of the Clean Water Act. Uh, so without uh, further ado, we'll turn it over to Ted and then John, and I'll rejoin at the end uh, to field questions. You're welcome to submit questions in the Q&A box or uh, the chat box, and we'll synthesize those questions and leave time to address uh, some of the more uh, frequently asked questions. So uh, thank you and take it away, Ted. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Elston, and I am the Senior Director for Policy and Government Relations at American Rivers. And uh, today I'm gonna help uh, sort of set the stage a little bit for how federal policy um, has helped to, uh, over the past 50 years, um, through the Clean Water Act has helped to clean the river and that that important uh, federal and state partnership that was developed there is a useful tool that is helping us nationwide and the Delaware provides us with a really nice sort of case sample for uh, how this, this success story um, can be replicated and, and is being replicated through our, our participation in, in nationally with the Clean Water Act. Uh, Sean, you're okay. Um, so, you know, about 30 years ago, uh, a little over that, um, actually about 50 years ago, um, only about 30, uh, a third of our waters were in fact swimmable and fishable. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the water protection we had at the federal level just wasn't adequate. And this was also a time when, you know, um, water treatment plants were, were relatively rare and folks were living by what we now to be sort of a, a debunked theory of dilution was the solution to pollution. Um, and we know now that there, you know, some things just can't be diluted and um, because of the nature of what the, you know, what those chemicals are. And then there's also just uh, some, in some instances, there's just not enough uh, volume to in fact uh, provide that dilution. So the, the Cuyahoga River um, was the sort of flashpoint, if you will, back in 1969 and created a lot of the publicity that surrounds and surrounded the uh, condition that a lot of our uh, nation's water bodies and rivers were, were under. Um, and it was, you know, it, it created a lot of national momentum and, and, and understanding of these challenges. Now the Delaware River was already uh, and had already been um, heavily impacted because of its previous, uh, the previous history of mining in the states uh, surrounding that watershed. And um, you know, the lack of sewage treatment plants or uh, inadequate sewage treatment plants, not meeting adequate standards for the day then, and certainly not meeting the standards uh, that we now uh, have placed on sewage treatment for our, our waters nationwide. Um, the Delaware River Basin Commission 
uh, was already established back in 1961 to try and help uh, regulate that water quality, uh, but it really didn't have enough, um, there weren't enough laws to actually help them have any teeth to uh, enforce anything. So while they were in place and, and, and trying to implement some of these uh, needed reforms on the way water was being treated and managed in the watershed, uh, it wasn't until we got uh, into the, the Clean Water Act um, in 1972 that really provided adequate um, federal regulation and teeth to uh, advance those um, harder standards on the states and, and localities to comply and, and clean up the river. Um, the, at the time, um, starting from 1947, uh, or 48, we had the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. It helped to provide some guidance and, um, you know, was sort of the first regulating force looking at uh, um, how we treated our waters, but it didn't provide enough real strength and, and um, legal power to, in fact, clean up those waters. It wasn't until um, the Clean Water Act, and we would, as is commonly known, the Clean Water Act now, which were in fact the uh, amendments to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act uh, that came about in 1972, that really was a critical evolution uh, in the way the federal government was gonna in, engage in helping to treat these waters. Um, it was now that um, the, uh, the, there were gonna be real regulations that were enforceable, uh, as well as the federal government stepping in to help with uh, funding uh, and, and technological advances to, in fact, clean these waters up. Um, the initial goal, which uh, unfortunately was unattainable, was to actually have our nation's water swimmable and fishable by 1983. Um, we are still battling that uh, to get to that level. Um, at present, we're somewhere around about a third of our waters are still not swimmable and fishable. So uh, there's still a, still a ways to go, but we're still working on it. Um, but the Clean Water Act did help fix, a, you know, a number of different things uh, that the Federal Water Pollution Control Act just had not had uh, adequate authorization to, in fact, uh, support. These included uh, establishing basic structure for regulating pollutant discharges into the waters of the U.S., uh, gave the EPA the authority to implement pollution control programs, uh, and setting wastewater standards for industry, uh, maintained existing water or requirements to set water quality for all contaminants. So this helped us to get beyond just some of the things from wastewater treatment, but also into discharges coming from factories and, and other uh, sources such as that, which might be you know, producing some uh, heavy metals and other contaminants that we needed to address. Uh, it helped to, uh, it was unlawful now for anyone to just discharge you know, from uh, a point source on their property into, the, uh, into the, our nation's waters, into the waters of the United States, our navigable waters as they're known. Um, again, dealing with factories and other places that, and, and wastewater treatments, you couldn't just put a pipe out there and dump it into our waters. Um, and then it also funded construction of sewage treatment uh, plants and, you know, provided construction grants program to help advance these, uh, these regulatory requirements. Um, the, the Clean Water Act basically has uh, created three uh, major pollution areas that they look at. Um, one being the point source uh, pollution, which is I was just describing is sort of that dis discernible, in fact, you know, very identifiable, a pipe coming off of a facility, whether it's a factory, wastewater treatment, or what have you. Uh, point source pollution is now required to be um, governed under the uh, NIPTES program, which is the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. And you need to get a uh, NIPTES permit for any kind of a point source direct discharge. And this, this is not just you get a permit and then you're allowed to discharge. You have to like talk with EPA and they then control what is in fact permitted to come out of the pipe and off your uh, facility. So they can look and if you're discharging heavy metals or other contaminants and things like that, they will govern how much you have to uh, uh, clean your water or filter it or do some sort of treatment before it's allowed to be discharged from that pipe into the waters of the United States. Next, thanks. Um, another major source that is a, an ongoing challenge is the non-point source pollution area. This is things like runoff from agricultural fields, 
uh, construction sites, uh, parking lots. These are largely unregulated and have been, you know, exempted from enforcement by the EPA. It's, it's one of the ongoing challenges that we now, in fact, face under the program um, because there can be a tremendous amount of runoff that come from things like parking lots, that come from things like agricultural fields. As you can sort of see here, you know, the, the inputs and chemical uh, applications on these fields is now being washed off into the waters. So this is, con this is one of the, you know, future and ongoing uh, challenges as to how do we're going to regulate these or control these and or, you know, allow, you know, if they're going to continue, how are we going to adapt our systems to uh, protect and, and, and um, not be as impacted as heavily as they can be. Um, these types of uh, sources, as we know, are things that impact uh, everything from the Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay. Um, many areas are impacted by these types of runoff. The other area that the uh, Clean Water Act controls that's a very important uh, feature is dredging and filling of our wetlands or waters. It now um, requires that uh, you receive a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers in order to be able to do any sort of dredge or fill. This is, you know, just as you're, you're, you would think it would be. It's filling wetlands or estuaries or marshlands or anything that's along our navigable waters, um, also known as the waters of the United States. Um, 404 permits are required for any of these activities under what are defined as navigable waters, um, which has been, or excuse me, navigable waters, which are defined as the waters of the United States. Those waters and what constitutes those waters are currently and have been for a little over a decade now, uh, really uh, a controversial area as to what waters require these types of permits. And this has been the result of a couple of different Supreme Court cases um, that has made it very challenging for the government to figure out exactly how to define and control where this uh, element of the Clean Water Act or this regulatory portion of the uh, Clean Water Act actually applies. Uh, the Obama administration um, tackled it with what they called the Clean Water Rule, um, trying to give very clear delineations as to what waters were in and were not uh, captured by the regulatory requirements of the 404 permit system. Um, the Trump administration came in, repealed that particular rule, and then went on to um, recently uh, issue their own rule on what uh, the navigable waters are. They've called that the navigable waters protection rule. Um, the current rules and, and activities of the Trump administration are under litigation because there's been a, a lot of challenges that people feel they've restricted that uh, application of the 404 system uh, too tightly. One of the real um, strengths and uh, unsung heroes, if you will, of the um, Clean Water Act has been the funding elements that were included. This has been a critical incentive and a real benefit for advancing these, you know, regulatory limits and, and new, you know, guidelines and goals and requirements that EPA has been setting on contaminants and, and discharges. Um, it was originally a, uh, a construction grant program which was uh, under the original amendments of the 1972 law. Um, in 1987, that was uh, replaced by what is called the uh, State Revolving Fund, better known as the SRFs. It's been a very popular program. It, it really helped to cement the federal and state partnership elements of the Clean Water Act, because now the federal government provides money to the states for their SRFs, which the states can then issue out to their localities to help them comply with the requirements of uh, the Clean Water Act's new, um, as I say, goals, criteria, uh, limits, and things like that. So they're able to go out and build clean water uh, facilities, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and things of that nature. And that money then revolves back to, as they pay those loans back, that money actually revolves back to the state to allow them to continue enhanced uh, funding for local uh, development and the needs of local communities to comply with the Clean Water Act law. And then, you know, the final uh, parting thought is that the government is, is sort of in the business of two things, regulation, regulation and funding. And when science helps to inform policy, we're better able to regulate against the problems and better fund those solutions. The Clean Water Act has been a great confluence between science and policy. 
Um, the two inform one another, help, helping to develop a more data-driven approach to regulation and helping create you know, better lives through cleaner water and, and these swimmable, fishable uh, access you know, that we all thrive and, and, and cherish about our country and bringing this, that, that quality of life back to everybody. Um, the Clean Water Act will continue to be an ongoing process, as we know, and as I mentioned, a third of our waters are still not swimmable and fishable, so we still have a ways to go. But the you know, Clean Water Act has been an, an important element to helping to achieve those goals. And the Delaware River specifically has been a great success story under which the Clean Water Act has been a you know, very valuable instrument to you know, getting this river watershed restored. And now 90% of the Delaware River estuary meets the swimmable fishable goals of the Clean Water Act and they're continuing to improve as we go. Uh, with that, I thank you, and um, uh, John Jackson is going to follow me up. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ted. Um, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I see well over 100 people online taking a little bit of their, their afternoon to learn a little bit about the Clean Water Act and also a little bit about the Delaware. Um, I called my presentation Celebrating the Delaware. This is, um, you know, River of the Year, but it's also a secret success story. We haven't and I, 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 it's been one of my pet peeves. We don't celebrate our successes enough. So four things I'm going to do today, and I'm going to be moving quickly. I'm going to talk about the environmental challenges of the Delaware. I'm going to share with you three reasons I think you can celebrate. These are real progress toward clean water and healthy streams. These are examples, if you're ever looking for a, an example, these will work for you. Um, I'm going to examine the question, are we done? And finally, bring it back home, and what can we do today? So one thing about water pollution in the Delaware is it didn't start in 1969 with the, the burning of the Cuyahoga. It didn't start in 1972 with the Clean Water Act. Water pollution in the Delaware has been an issue for a long time. It was, for example, instead of the Cuyahoga burning, the Delaware, in this case, the, the biggest tributary of the Delaware, the Schuylkill River, burned in and made the New York Times in 1892. 1892, the river's on fire and it makes the New York Times. <clears throat> this is a, a um, editorial cartoon from the Philadelphia Inquirer. It's called Wash Day in Philadelphia, another phase of the water question, 1899. March 1899, long before the Clean Water Act, long before the Cuyahoga. This is from the Philadelphia record. It shows the Delaware on one side and the Schuylkill on the other, both of which are drinking water sources for Philadelphia. And it's, uh, the, the caption is, water, water everywhere, but not a drop fit to drink. This is 1937. And finally, from right down in, in, in the heart of Philadelphia, this is a quote by Rusty Callow that described the Schuylkill. Now he was the rowing coach at UPenn and he described the Schuylkill as much too thick to drink, much too thin to plow. Not exactly complimentary. This was from the 1930s. So as bad as it was, and it clearly was bad and it was bad way back in the 1890s, early 1900s, there are some terrific examples of how things have gotten better. And I'm gonna roll through three. One is the Schuylkill River Project. Um, I refer to this as the nation's first super funds project, 1947 to 1951. The second one is, is, is a recent project, or a recent uh, discovery really by the Delaware River Basin Commission uh, the recovery of the fisheries in the Delaware estuary. And the third is some data that comes out of Chester County in southeastern PA, and it's the recovery of three adjacent tributaries around um, <coughs> the place you would recognize um, 
would, would be Valley Forge National Park. So first, the Schuylkill Project. This is a story that predates probably almost everybody online in that it didn't get started planning until the 1930s, early 1940s, didn't get started until 1947. But to get to that point, we had to go from a Schuylkill that uh, Benjamin Latrobe described in 1799 as a river of uncommon purity. It was so clean that it was targeted as the water source of Philadelphia. So on the right, I have a map of Philadelphia from 1800, and it, you can see all the development is on the Delaware side. And whereas the city has been laid out, the development hasn't occurred on the Schuylkill side. And with that in mind, they constructed the center square uh, waterworks right in the center of town, in center square, which is right now where City Hall was. It was a double steam engine water pump that pumped Schuylkill water up over the hill and into Philadelphia. Now it was only functional for about 30 years before the waterworks, about halfway through the waterworks in Philadelphia took over. <clears throat> After that though, Philadelphia continued to grow. And, and so by the 1948, 49, in the middle of the clean water, in the Schuylkill project, we see this title from the Saturday Evening Post describing the Schuylkill as Pennsylvania's foulest river. And so the title of the article is, they're cleaning up Pennsylvania's foulest river at last. What was involved in the Schuylkill project was immense. Details, if you wanna look, if you Google Cherry Towns, um, a river again, the story of the Schuylkill. This is a story the Delaware River Keeper has put together nicely, but it was massive. 47 different coal operations stopped discharging waste to the river. Orders were issued to 30 municipalities, 500 industries to improve their wastewater treatment plant. Three desilting pools were constructed. 50% of, the, of uh, the estimated two 24 million cubic yards of coal waste, this is waste in the river, was removed. And this thing stretched for over a hundred miles. The net effect though of this, the positive effect is the river got better almost instantly, but it took a long time to get much better. So now we talk about brook trout in the upper Schuylkill, but we didn't talk about that in 1951. It took another 50 years before the landscape really recovered from the intensity of this use. The second story I want to tell you is one that was put together by the Delaware River Basin Commission. And there's, there's no single action that can be given credit for it, but what they did in analyzing the data from the 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s is they discovered that several fish down in the Delaware estuary, many of which are migratory fish, were suddenly able to survive and reproduce. This was an outcome that, while desirable, nobody had predicted. It was, not it, it was a, a, in my opinion, a surprise when it was finally discovered that we had reproduction of these fish down there. And one of the reasons why was we went from a, a, an estuary that had a significant dissolved oxygen challenge to one that was quite positive. So these are the data from 1965 to the present. This is at Benjamin Franklin Bridge and this is dissolved oxygen in July. And in, in the early days, the 60s and 70s, zeros and ones and twos, this would be difficult if not impossible for most fish to, to survive. But then we see a gradual increase so that now this July data, which would be the most stressful time, is bouncing around between four and eight. And that's a positive thing. The fish are finding a positive, the fish are surviving and reproducing. And suddenly we have fish reproduction in an area of the estuary that probably hasn't seen it for over a hundred years. Third example is, is much more local. These are in the tributaries. And without a doubt, wastewater treatment plants are part of that estuary story, but so are the tributaries. The tributaries deliver the water to the main stem of the Delaware. These are three streams that run side by side, French Creek, Pickering Creek, and Valley Forge. These are data that are collected as a partnership from the US Geological Survey, USGS, and the Chester County Water Resources Authority. 
Again, not my story, but I'm really happy to share it with you. We were lucky, these guys started collecting data back in the 1970s and continue to do it annually. Each of these plots are year across the bottom and on the, on the vertical axis, it's the number of pollution sensitive families. And in all three cases, we more than doubled the number of species that we were finding. So in French Creek, we went from eight, six to eight up to 12 to 16. Pickering Creek, we we're down at four to six and now we're at eight to 12. In Valley Forge, where we were at the zero to four, we're now at the four to six. Everyone is doubled in this time frame, and you'll notice how quickly it happened. This is one thing to also keep in mind. The Clean Water Act maybe was enacted in 1972, but we were doing soil conservation actions in these, in what were at this time, agricultural watersheds, starting back in the 1940s and 50s, and these streams started improving as soon as we started collecting data. And some of that has to do with farm practices improving. The net result though, is each of these streams has a designated use. And um, in two of the three, the protection status was upgraded. So French Creek was upgraded in 1998 and in 2010 to exceptional value. The highest protection Pennsylvania gives a river or a stream. The same thing happened in 1993 for Valley Forge Creek. We put in a petition, partners did, to do this upgrade in um, Pickering Creek. It was not successful. It doesn't mean the improvement wasn't real. They just said it didn't pass the threshold. So where are we at? We're clearly better than we were. But are we better across the board? These are data from over 300 sites from throughout the Delaware. This is a macroinvertebrate score I use to summarize all of these bugs that we collect from the stream. 20 would be a great stream, zero would be a horrible stream. <clears throat> Basically, about a quarter of the streams are good, about half are fair, and about a quarter or poor. But what I tend to say is, is I draw the line right in the middle, people ask me where the Delaware at, the Delaware is fair about half of our streams are showing some degree of degradation, even with the doubling that we've seen. Unfortunately, we don't have data from all of these sites, but it's safe to assume based on what we've seen in Chester County and Bucks County, that most of these streams are better than they were. In other words, if I was to go back to 1972, this might be the line. All boats have floated. That's a process of, of making good decisions, and that's great news. In other words, the, the water streams that we saw in 1960 and 1970 are presumably better. But as Ted mentioned, we haven't reached the Clean Water Act goal where all the streams would be up in this blue category. We still have a lot to do. But we have more success stories in our future. In the Delaware, 135 dams have been removed. So those uses that are tied to migratory fish, to fish habitat, tied to water temperature, tied to habitat in terms of flowing water versus still water. All of these are going to be success stories, positive additions to the waterways. We're also improving many farms every year and planting thousands of trees every year along the tributaries of the Delaware. Every one of those trees captures sediment. Every one of those trees removes nitrogen. Every one of those trees shades the stream, making it cooler, making it a healthier stream, a better stream. So what can we do? What can we do as citizens? How do we get more clean streams? How do we get healthier streams? These are my four suggestions, and these are just suggestions that work for me. One is celebrate your successes. We have done so many great things, and we've been doing them over the last 50 years, and that's part of the problem. Our progress might be viewed as slow, but steady. And it's really hard to throw a big party when you're doing slow and steady, but we need to. We need to look for those opportunities. Second, don't litter, pick up litter. Third, reduce your chemical footprint and finally get involved. So let's work through these. How do we do uh, get more clean water? First, don't litter, don't pick up litter. This is visual pollution. And the visible message is that we don't care about these waters, or it may even say that the water is dangerous, even if it's not true. 
that's the message that people get. The other thing is, is litter is really the tip of the pollution iceberg. And if we can't deal with the pollution that we see, how do we engage the public to deal with the pollution that we can't see, which is by far and away most of the pollution that we really have concerns about? Tied to that is, has to do with our chemical footprint, the stuff that's hard to see. We live in a chemical world. It's very different than our parents or grandparents or great grandparents did. What we have to do is we need to use more caution when we're using and disposing of these chemicals. Every one thing you see in the picture here, in one way, shape, or form, ends up in our water, ends up in our waterways, and has the potential for measurable impacts. Finally, share your time, share your skills, share your values. Join a watershed group. Join your municip municipal uh, environmental committee. Join the local planning commission. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to have all the answers. But what we need you to do is ask the hard questions. And the hard question is, for example, if you're on a planning commission, ask the question, is this going to make our water cleaner? How much? How soon? And if not, why not? Why can't we? Those are really challenging questions Anybody can ask it, and we all deserve a good answer to those questions. So points to remember, celebrate. We've made good choices. Regulatory support together has made the Delaware River and its tributaries cleaner and healthier. Second thing is the streams in the Delaware River Basin are still polluted. There are many that have challenges. So there's more to do, and that's happening right now. <clears throat> but there's also, a important thing remember we have a clean future in the uh, a cleaner future is possible it's all about good choices and positive actions and it all starts with us our good choices our positive actions so thank you very much i really appreciate having the time to share these success stories with you thank you so much john and ted uh, please uh, uh, put some questions in the Q&A box. We do have a few I'll go through. Uh, question for Ted and John, but before we get to those, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor uh, for today's webinar, Pennsylvania American Water. Uh, you may have seen the video at the beginning. Um, so thank you for uh, sponsoring um, not just this webinar, but our series as well. Uh, so, First question, and uh, again, please add more. Uh, we'll try to get to them. We have about five minutes remaining. Uh, Ted, directly to you from David Ross. Uh, how do we balance the link between science and policy against the impact of private property rights and policy? Um, well, thank you. It's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, the um, Clean Water Act, um, applications and the, in, the impacts on private property has been, uh, is not, uh, I don't feel is as great as people sometimes like to make it out to be. Um, in most cases, the Clean Water Act does not uh, prohibit or impair most uh, impacts on um, private property rights. Um, it may require some level of mitigation uh, in order to do certain things if you're impacting wetlands or things of that nature. And that's uh, um, in part because uh, those impacts are beyond just what you're doing on your own private property. You know, you're not allowed to go, you know, I don't think anybody would have a, a question about are you allowed to go and change your property in such a way that you're flooding your neighbor out. Well, that's, that's some of the impacts that occur if you start changing wetlands. And right now, um, between uh, the way the regulations apply and um, getting permits and things like the general permit process, which is a very efficient and quick process. Uh, most, most activities on properties are able to go forward. They just may require some level of mitigation. Um, and um, statistically, the EPA says over 95% of permit applications are ultimately approved. So it's just a matter of working through what you're trying to do and how it's impacting things and what kinds of uh, either maybe changes to the project uh, to try and accommodate some of these uh, common goods and, and the protection of the common um, wheel. Thanks, thanks for that. 
I'm, I'm guessing John has uh, some thoughts there too, but let's jump to the next question. Maybe we, uh, you can come back to it, John. This one's sort of for both of you, but we'll start with Ted. How, how do we accelerate and enhance efforts uh, to bring science into the public debate and policy and policy development? Um, I mean, I think that science is, uh, well, um, the current political environment has uh, a challenging way of uh, thinking and dealing with the uh, with science, unfortunately. Um, I think that's just a plain fact uh, that people can accept or not. Um, I think um, historically uh, that science um, has been brought into the uh, development of public policy um, at a, a fairly acceptable rate. And part of it is, uh, good science takes a while to actually be developed to a point, and that's through peer reviewing papers and uh, repeating these, uh, you know, scientific uh, um, concepts to a point that people are, are able to accept them as being valid and, and real things that need to be addressed. And, uh, but as I say, the, the current political environment um, constantly questions what had been historically accepted um, science. Uh, can I add something there? I think Ted is spot on about the time, the, the time to do the science. Uh, I'm looking at two data sets that are over 20 years old. Uh, it took 20 years to see the improvements that, that we planned on and we, we invested in, in measuring. Um, it's important to remember that, that, for example, streams that we're working on for these restorations we messed around in them and degraded them for 300 years. To fix that overnight is, is uh, possible, but very expensive. So much of our cleanup action is actually letting nature heal itself. It's very cost effective. These streams can recover, the watersheds can recover if we take the pressure off of them, if we start doing the right thing. The other thing is, and, and we need the help from the public to do this, but we need to bring the science forward better. We need people to better understand what we, un what we know and what we don't know and why we're doing what we're doing, in part to get better support. Um, we may not always be right, but we're doing, uh, giving it our best with what we understand today. Yeah, that's, that's both really good points. I think uh, current uh, setting is a bit different than the historical context on science bridging into policy. And certainly uh, we need to come together as a community, whether you're a scientist or uh, an advocate or an environmentalist or a concerned citizen and continue to voice uh, the importance to us all of having science informed policy and that feedback loop strongly represented in the way we fix our problems today. Um, We'll go, go to a, a different question, uh, maybe for John, or, or maybe if Bob's still there, he might know best, but um, had, was the Delaware River ever um, supportive of Atlantic salmon specifically, John, that you remember in the history? Uh, no, there's, there's a lot of discussion about that. Um, the <laughs> last time I read something on that was, was to suggest that they actually brought it down trying to establish it. Uh, back in the 1800s, but um, if you were to look at, at fisheries records that I've seen, what, what the Delaware had was a marvelous, unbelievable migratory fish um, assemblage, but it was alewife and, and blueback herring and, um, and American shad by the billions every April. Good. And if I can just add to that, the, uh, if, if people are interested in that, read John McPhee's book, The Founding Fish, uh, which will really give you a sense of how rich the Delaware was, uh, particularly for shad. Excellent. Great recommendation on the read there. Well, we're, we're just about out of time, and there's a few questions that came in that might, might take uh, a while to discuss, but um, I think this one's worth airing if we can. There's a question here that asks us to address how environmental justice is impacted um, by efforts in both our organizations uh, and you know the changes that we can make as organizations or as individuals 
uh, to address those environmental justice issues and, and build you know, more equitability uh, in how we fix our environmental problems. Well, I can start on behalf of American Rivers. Um, you know, um, working for environmental justice is, is central to what we do. We can't be successful uh, in the work that we do to, to protect and restore rivers and clean water uh, if we also don't uh, engage in the fight for justice uh, in this uh, country. And in, in terms of the, the Delaware and rivers all over the country, you know, communities of color and historically marginalized communities are often communities that suffer the most from uh, pollution. So when, when the Delaware and the Schuylkill had all of that, that terrible pollution, uh, it really affected uh, communities of color disproportionately more than other communities. And so cleaning up those rivers is, is key to improving the lives for everyone. Uh, but it's, all, it's not enough to just say, oh, we're going to do this and, and we're here to help you. What really matters is to actually engage communities of color and historically marginalized communities in the work. And to, for, for those of us who, who are white and privileged to sit down and actually be willing to, to listen uh, to members of those communities about what they want to see and what they need, and then to help them uh, in, to become more engaged uh, in, in the fight to clean up these rivers. Yeah, and I think from the Stroudwater research perspective, uh, you know, our, our mission is threefold, research, education, and restoration. Uh, um, the work that we do is in, incredibly relevant to urban communities, to underrepresented communities. Uh, we are working in those communities. The, um, the education side is sort of multifaceted and the, maybe one of the first steps is building a more diverse community of scientists and community of practitioners. And part of that is, you know, building a, a more diverse organization and approach uh, and, and helping uh, build our community to have stronger voices from the communities that are impacted uh, uh, in, in that way by the environmental injustices that are done there. And that's certainly something the Stroud Center is uh, pursuing. And uh, I know that many of my freshwater colleagues around the country and the world are also uh, more laser focused on that uh, aspect as well. John or Ted, anything to add there or conclude with? As I think we're over a little bit and we should probably wrap up. I'm good on my end. Oh, I'm good. I think Bob really spoke well to what American Rivers' uh, role is now and as we're proceeding forward is to really trying to ensure that um, minority and underserved communities uh, are being appropriately recognized and, and, and treated through federal policy development as well as application and, and availability of uh, federal resources to ensure that the uh, historic injustices are being resolved and cleaned up and, and that these communities are living in cleaner, safer uh, conditions, much as like the rest of the country does and, and ensure that they are not left on the sidelines. Well, great. Thank you all for your time. It's uh, wonderful to be part of celebrating uh, the Delaware River for this year. Thank our sponsor once again, Pennsylvania American Waters and um, Please join us for the next webinar in the series in October. Uh, we, there will be emails and announcements as we get closer to October and uh, registration window will open up one month prior. Uh, Bob, any parting words? Uh, just to say thank you uh, to the Stroud Center for the great work you do. And uh, it's wonderful to partner with you. And as John said, let's celebrate this success. This is a great, great success that we've seen in the Delaware, and let's work for more successes all over the country. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.